This is part one of the Craftsman King Sealy 150 Drill Press Rebuild Series. If you haven't checked out my channel, I have several other drill press rebuilds as well as other tool rebuild series. In this video, we will have a brief overview of the 150 and then we will get into the disassembly. Hello everyone, I'm Jeff and welcome to my shop. We got a lot to cover, so let's get to it. This is a Craftsman King Sealy 150 series 15 and a half inch drill press. This one was built in 1964 and its model number is 103-24511. This actually belongs to a friend of mine and he's asked me to rebuild it so I'm going to rebuild it. The motor is a 113-19352 half horsepower. It has sleeve bearings and it is 1725 RPMs. So the 150 series was an improvement over the 100 series drill press and it went through a couple of iterations. This is the first generation of them and notice the spring tension knob. But all of these other changes are the same on all of the 150s. The later models had an internal return spring and this would con continue through all of the Emerson models. So this 150 does have an internal spring and we will get to that a little later. We're going to go ahead and start with the disassembly and the first thing we're going to be doing is removing the motor. So as I said, they have a tilting motor mount. This allows you to change the uh, belt on different sheaves easier. It still has the same two lock screws for where the motor mount pins go into the head casting that's what I'm loosening up now but down at the bottom of the motor mount there's a stud that comes out of the back of the head casting and locks inside the motor mount so that you can lock it in a level position and they they changed the motor mount and how that's that bottom stud locks into it there was actually I think three different styles of it but this is the style that's on this one. And maybe someday I'll do a video where I've got, you know, some examples of all three of the styles and whatnot. And that may help you narrow down what year the drill press was made a little easier when you have these minor nuances in them. But because of the model number, we know that this is a King Sealy 1964 drill press. And we know that because Emerson took over production in 1964 of the drill presses. And in that year alone, there were Emerson and King Sealy drill presses that were identical, except for the prefix of the model number, which is 103 for King Sealy and 113 for Emerson. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to release the tension in the spring. And since this has an internal spring as opposed to older models that have a tension knob on the outside, you basically just pull the hub towards the camera while you're holding the, uh, the quill and rotate it away from you. And that releases the spring tension. Now we're removing the uh, feed stop collar and this has a quick uh, adjust feed stop collar and that was a change from the 100 to the 150 so the original 150s came out in 1958 and King Sealy made all of those from 58 all the way up to 64 and then in 64 Emerson took over production and Emerson continued to make 150s for three years so the 150 era ended in 1966. So here we just pulled out the hub and then pulled the quill straight down. And now I'm releasing the spring. So inside there is a roll pin that the loop on the end of that spring is hooked over. And all we did is push up on the spring and we were able to pull the hub out. Now we're going to remove the quill lock and disassemble it. Oddly enough, in all of the years, from the 100s all the way to the 150s, they never changed the lock handle here for the, uh, for the quill lock. It's a, it's a screw that 
fits inside a chrome handle and there's a little set screw that locks it in there. So here I'm going to try to remove the machine screws. There's one on each side. Usually this, depending on the condition of the drill press, a lot of times I'll see that, you know, dirt daubers or whatever have made a little home in there and uh, it's all caked up and really hard to see the screw head itself. But if we can get a bite on it with the screwdriver, we'll go ahead and pull it out. And when I pulled this one out, it's too short. It's not the proper screw that's supposed to be in there. It just fell to the ground. I'm going to pick it up here in a second. And I'm just looking to see if it maybe it was broken and half of it's on the inside. Because these get bent or broken off all the time. But no, somebody put smaller screws in here on both sides, which kind of defeats the purpose of those screws. And if you've got questions about that, I've got a video about the internal processes and interactions, and I'll put a link for it here. And that video will explain what those two little machine screws do and why they're there. And you'll have a better understanding of that. So here I'm just coating down the uh, column a little bit with some WD-40 so we can get the head off of the column. So we're going to undo the lock and then, well, we'll go ahead and raise that table up. That way if the, uh, the head comes loose and it falls, it's not going to fall too far. Sometimes I'll put a 2x4 on the table so that it, the head's got something to smack on as opposed to cast iron hitting cast iron but not real worried about it falling unlock it start it rotating a little and then there it goes and then we can hopefully get it off of there without it binding up so there's two bores on the back side of the head that the column rides in and you just gotta that bottom bore can be Kind of a pain in the butt to get, but there we go. So now we'll just go ahead and remove the headlock and disassemble it. So this was another change with the 150s. The lock handles are more improved from the 100 series. And there may actually be some 100s out there that have these lock handles. We're not entirely sure what year those went into effect. So we'll just undo the lock for the table and then lift it up. And then we'll remove the lock for the table as well and disassemble it. And here we're just loosening and then removing the big set screw for the column. And this is actually pushing on or it should be pushing on a lock shoe that is inside the base that then pushes on the column and locks the column in place. So once we get that screw out, then we'll attempt to remove the column. Sometimes you might need to work at this. Mine's rotating, so I think we can get it out. We're just going to hit it with some WD-40 to expedite that. So I have lots of other uh, drill press rebuilds. So if you run into problems with removing those small set screws or removing the column from the base or anything like that, check out some of my other videos. You'll see a couple different methods that I've come up with on how to do that. Perhaps one day I'll put together a video that kind of covers how to address all of these issues. And here we're just going to remove that lock shoe. There it is. So over at the workbench, we've got the head here, and we're going to go ahead and remove that switch panel that's on the side. Now that is not OEM. That was installed by the original owner, I guess, or one of his relatives. This was actually quite common. You'll see a lot of drill presses that you pick up, come out of barns and whatnot that have something like this mounted on them and uh, with an on-off switch. But we're going to be doing something different uh, when we get to reassembling this drill press. So we will be throwing that lock box away or that switch box away because 
I have no use for it. Now, the reason why there, there was not an on-off switch on the drill press is because these were sold without the motors. Um, the motors were purchased separately, and that way you might have a motor already, or, you know, all of these belt-driven tools were kind of sold this way. Um, and a lot of the motors have an on-off switch on the motor. So there was no need to put an on-off switch on the drill press. And there's no electrical components to the drill press. It's all in the motor itself. Until you get out of the 150 generation. And once you start getting into the Gen 2 uh, Emerson series, which I have plenty of videos on those, those do have wiring in them with on-off switches and lights and that kind of stuff. I probably should have sped this footage up a little bit. So one thing you can do is if you're removing something like this and you want to have kind of a... Oh, my dog is barking. Um, if you want to get rid of the holes that somebody drilled into the head casting to mount this thing. There is a two-part epoxy that I like to use for that. It's called PC7. You can get it at most of your uh, Ace Hardware stores, and I think they even sell it on Amazon. But you mix up the two-part epoxy, and then you can just fill it in in those holes. And then... Uh, about an hour after it started to set, you can come back with a piece of sandpaper and kind of just press the sandpaper on it and it'll end up having this roughly the same texture as the cast iron. And then when you get to painting, you'll never, never know the difference. And that's probably what we'll end up doing with this drill press. Uh, just because we're not going to be mounting anything in those two holes there. All right, so here we are with that other machine screw. And uh, the head on it is kind of uh, messed up. And so getting the screwdriver to get a bite on it is giving me some trouble here. Now, sometimes these heads can break off and then you're going to have to drill it out. But I'm going to, I'll get a bite on it with that screwdriver. I think I'm going to stick a screwdriver down in there and kind of tap it with a uh, hammer to force it into the slot on the head. And then see if we can just get it. And there it is. Yep. So it's biting now. And luckily, this machine screw was also uh, incorrect. It was too short. So I think these screws were like three-eighths of an inch, and they should have been three-quarters of an inch in length. So we'll be replacing those. But, yeah. So here we're going to remove the uh, spindle pulley assembly. And here you can see there are two ball bearings on the spindle pulley assembly and then there are two bear, uh, bearing boards that we've got to push both of those ball bearings out of and then we'll be smacking the bottom of the pulley shaft. So I'm just going to stick a wooden dowel up in there and then we're going to drive the pulley shaft to the left which will force the bearings out of those bores. So once you get them out of the first bore That'll free up the top pulley, or the one that's furthest to the left, but the bottom pulley needs to get realigned with the top bore, if that makes any sense, and then continue to push it out. And we can thank Frank Lee for providing that cutaway view. There's more of the cutaway showing the internals of, of these things in that 
uh, internal processes and in our operations video that I said that I linked earlier. So there is the spindle pulley assembly. So there is a outer snap ring inside the bottom bore that we need to remove. And that's actually what the bottom pulley rest on, or bottom uh, bearing rest on. Next, we're going to remove the headband and it has two drive screws, one on each side. We're just driving those drive screws out from the inside. The holes for them are drilled all the way into the casting, so it's real easy to get them out of there. We're just using a small punch to do that. There's one. And then we'll remove the second one. And that'll wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe. I will have links down in the description of the video for the owner's manuals and all of that kind of stuff. If you got any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below. Uh, don't forget all of my other videos on my channel. In the next video, we'll continue with the disassembly. As always, I appreciate the support, and I will see you next time.